is your favorite foxy writer here with another episode of my Hunter's Gambit Read Along. <laughs> First off, though, updates. I have finished rewriting chapter one and I have edited chapters two and three. I also recorded and released another video just yesterday, actually, um, about the new Vroid Studio update. <laughs> that one was unplanned and sort of cut into my editing and uh, time, but I really wanted to let everybody know how easy it is to make an avatar with it. Oh, I'm also hosting a contest and uh, giving people a chance to, crew, uh, to win the avatar that I created right here. Isn't she adorable? <laughs> I love how she looks. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Anyways, go check that out if you're interested. Um, also, I had an amazing time during my Saturday NaNoWriMo Sprint stream, and I actually got a chapter and a bit written of a new novel. So if you're interested in hearing that chapter, um, it's in a rough draft and completely unedited, you can go over to my Twitch to hear me read it out on stream, but if you're all eager to hear something unedited, I can also add it in here. Uh, just let me know in the comments below, okay? <laughs> okay, last week, Isashi spoke to Himiko and found out that Kazunaha and Richard had left town. Um, uncertain of his intent, Isashi was willing to go out and find them when she found out that a large, dangerous monster had been seen around uh, Hidan. The hunters had been voluntold to team up and head out to find out more about the creature before they make a plan to take it down. Isashi teams up with another hunter, Hana, but insists that they check on the two civilians while they're out there. <laughs> and now, on with the story. <laughs> there we go! And perfect. Let me just uh, pull up the book here. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Kizunaha ran through the forms her training master had drilled into her for the three years her father had kept him on retainer. Richard was not being particularly kind to Master Chivek's work. Did your father tell this man to make you useless in any form of combat? You can only use that attack on people smaller than yourself. Trust me when I say there aren't many. She flushed. Her height was a weak spot for her. Why not? Master Chivik said I was as well trained as any youth. He pulled out one of his own blades. It's an issue of reach, not training. Let me show you. Kazunaha moved towards Richard. Lazily, he caught the tip of her blade near the hilt of his. He flicked his wrist and Kazunaha almost lost hold of her dagger. She looked disgusted. He said he taught us all the formal forms. Richard nodded. Formally, you're very well trained. But he didn't teach you how to fight. If you were just trying to dance with it, play fighting with other nobles, you wouldn't have an issue. You would look very pretty while meeting blades and not hurting each other. She growled, and he gestured for her to attack him. Let's get to work making you efficient. Come at me. Full speed. Are you sure? <laughs> I don't think you could hurt me unless you get lucky, he said. I've been working with blades a long time. You learn best by doing. With trepidation, she held her blade in her hand and took a fighting stance. Her lunge was slow and faltering. His blade caught hers and he pushed her back harder. She came at him a few more times, feeling her way. He looked bored, annoyed at her ineffectuality. I told you to come at me full speed, not a snail's pace. You, you took a bolt to the side just over a month ago. Thank you for your concern, but it's not necessary, he said. Stop trying to hit me and hit me. She let go of herself and lunged forward. Richard adjusted the match, finally grinning. Her attacks hit closer and she pressed, wanting to take the advantage. 
You're fast and agile, Richard said. But you can see that all the forms you've been taught all end with my blade beating yours. That's what they're supposed to do in fake combat. In a real battle, never. You need to hide your movements, hit harder, and know where to strike. Somehow, between one breath and the next, he pushed her back. Kazunaha's breathing hitched, trying to keep up with him. She backed up, trying to anticipate his next strike, working hard to regain the ground she'd just lost. Better, he said, but this is what you need to be able to do. The dagger is an extension of your arm. Be aware of all your weapons, and all of your opponent's weapons. His left fist came at her. She leapt back, dodging the blow, but falling on her ass. She grunted at the impact on tired muscles. Not bad, even if you weren't trained to use those skills instinctively. With a fluid motion, he put his dagger away and reached a hand out to help her up. She took it. So I'm not completely useless. Good to know. The falling sunlight flashed in her eyes as she looked at the ocean. She hadn't thought they'd reached the bluffs past Nordstrom on the second day, but they had. Seen from the ground, the bluffs were beautiful, black and white stone, with no clinging ivy to distract the eye, over a hundred feet tall. Tiny purple and red flowers stuck out in the tiny cracks on the cliff face they stood on, and the dimming light made it feel like the world ended there, dropping into an abyss in the enroaching gloom. To the west and south of them lay a swamp that would soon be buzzing with life, but for now was still blessedly quiet. Richard smiled at her. For a noble, you're decent. The problem is that your master trained you, never imagining that you would need to use it in a life-or-death situation. You might dance with other nobles, but he didn't think you would need to know how to kill someone. Kazunaha felt blood pouring over her hand again, and swallowed tightly. She distracted herself by wondering if her father had demanded that she and Himiko only learn the formal forms, effectively preventing them from taking drastic measures against him, or perhaps if he had believed that fighting with a blade was too barbaric a pastime for his daughters, and had curtailed their teachings. Either way, she cursed his intrusive hand on her life again. While I don't want to get comfortable with... Defending yourself is something else entirely. I understand. Come on, let's clean up. He gestured for her to walk with him. In the copse of trees that backed their camp, Richard had tied up a blanket to offer some privacy. He proudly opened the blanket, and she saw a black sack up in a tree, with an attached tube hanging a mere foot or so above her head. She'd expected to see a collapsible tub if they were going to have a chance to bathe. Hmm, the water has been heating since I set it up. When you twist this, he tapped a small lever attached to the hose, the water will flow. I put sand down too, so the ground won't get too muddy. How hot does it get? she asked. Richard shrugged. If we left it out in the sun over the noon hour? Very. Right now, it's only sun-warmed. Like a swimming pond, midday? It'll be safe, she asked. The check they'd done on the area had come back clean of monster tracks or any of their leavings. From what she and Richard could tell, nothing but regular animals had been by this way in quite a while. And still, she had to ask. Perhaps it had to do with her never being this far out of a dan, or on her own, essentially. But starting about midday, she felt as if she were being followed, though neither of them had seen anything. We've checked. There are no tracks, no sounds of monsters, no leavings, awful, or yeah, even anything left to show that the area has been recently cleaned. We'll sleep lightly. But so long as we stay somewhat alert, we should have plenty of time to respond to any threats. I'll go first, though, so you can stay on watch. I can do that, Kazunaha said. Somehow she felt better knowing that he trusted her to be on watch. He smiled. Why don't you get dinner started? We'll trade when I'm done. Sounds fair. Have fun. She gave a little wave. He grinned and stepped behind the sheet. Walking back into the camp, she grabbed the pot that Richard had used the day before. How hard could cooking be? 
vegetables, meat, and water, the pot on the fire. It would be easy. When Richard was done, he came out wearing nothing but pants and boots. He looked good with his hair and skin wet. His dark skin gleamed in the fading sun. Most that lived in Hidan were Sien Ku, or descendants of the Korvdai, who had given up their wandering ways like Tiani. A few were like Deckard, with his skin and hair so pale it seemed like a glass drained of ink. None of them were like Richard, a dark almond caramel mix. He smiled, and she looked away. She hadn't been staring, had she? The rest of the water is yours. Don't use it up if you don't have to. We can use what's left to wash the dishes, and save us another trip down to the water. She nodded and stood, handing him the spoon she'd be mixing the pot with. Kuzu? What were you making? he asked as she left. His voice was tense. My name is Kazunaha, she reminded him. I was making soup. Is something wrong? She turned back to see him frowning over the pot, spoon in hand. With a dismissive wave, he shooed her away. Kazunaha left to it, shrugging out of her clothes and stepping onto the sand. She had to reach to twist the valve, but Richard had been right about the water. It was still warm and soothed her muscles. She sighed, glad to finally wash off the two days of sweat. Still, she washed quickly and toweled the rest of the water from her body. Only the faint sounds of crackling flame and boiling pot permeated the night air. A heavy thud broke the calm. Kazunaha dropped her towel, grabbing her dagger with her other hand. Richard? There was some grunting before he responded. It sounded forced, as if through clenched teeth. Kuzu? I could use some assistance. She didn't even take the time to dress. Richard was lying on the ground, a few feet from the campfire. A cockatrice was poised above him. His sides were bloody, caught by the creature's flechette-like wingtips. They would hurt, but they usually weren't deadly. Its beak, on the other hand, could tear children's arms from their bodies, and it was only inches away from Richard's neck. Neither Richard nor the cockatrice moved, locked together in a frozen tableau. Richard's dagger had driven just behind its beak towards its brain. Unfortunately, Richard couldn't make good on the blow. If he tried to pull it out to try again, the creature would be at his throat. Neither wanted to die to succeed. Kazunaha ran at the creature, aiming with the metal hilt. She hit its head and the cockatrice stumbled to the side, off Richard. She followed up her attack with another, forcing the creature to back away further, though it was already shaking off any disorientation from her first blow. Behind her, Richard swore and ran to the fire. The cockatrice's head came up. Richard's knife was still in it, dripping black blood and gore down to the handle. The cockatrice opened its jaw and hissed at her, cutting off midway as it focused on the blade in her hands. Its eyes, shades of piss and summer grass, blinked. Slowly, it lowered its head, never dropping eye contact, and lifted one of its legs, a black scaly stick with three talons nearly an inch long. It grasped the dagger handle and ripped it out, dropping the pitted blade with an insectoid click. Kazunaha brandished her dagger, and the cockatrice tilted its head from side to side, an almost human gesture of confusion. Blackish blood dripped steadily from the hole in its neck, making red mud on the ground. From her right, a black blade whisked by, catching the cockatrice in the head. The creature slumped down, the light leaving its eyes in a rush. Kazunaha felt shaky, and she wondered if her legs would hold her up. The creature jerked, and she flung herself back, its wingtips missing her by inches. She hadn't realized that she'd been that close. She breathed a sigh of relief when the creature stopped spasming, as if even in death it wanted to claim their lives. From behind it and to the right, Richard stepped out of the shadows. Richard, what happened? Where did it come from? Richard was covered in sticky black blood, and his eyes were wide, focused on the creature in front of them. 
When he looked up at her to answer, his jaw dropped. I'm not... Wow. She blinked at him and then looked down at herself. Her skin was wet, luminescent in the dying sun's rays. She'd forgotten she was naked. She turned and Richard coughed into his hand. She glanced his way and was relieved to see that he had turned partially from her as well. She ran for her clothes, dodging back behind the curtain. Ahem. I have no idea where it was hiding or why it waited until now to come out. Are they usually this silent? Richard called. Kazunaha shook her head, forgetting that he couldn't see her behind the curtain. Sorry, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a hunter. Don't apologize. <laughs> Despite your training, you're an asset and lucky to boot. We'll both know to keep a better eye out from now on. Thank you. She smiled with pleasure. There's water left. You can wash off. And then we can see if any of those injuries need stitching. Give me five minutes to sort things out first. In the meantime, finish getting dressed. She had just finished when Richard came to rinse off. Most of his wounds were thin slits, but two needed stitches to stop bleeding. She had a steady hand, even if she hadn't stitched a wound before. When they returned to the fire, her soup was gone, replaced by cut vegetables and meat cubes on skewers. Richard sat down and coaxed red-hot coals to flame again. What happened to the soup? Kazuna asked. He looked up at her. Have you ever cooked before? No, she said. I figured soup would be the easiest to make. Did I do it wrong? He was silent. It got knocked over during the battle. I saved what I could. He pulled a skewer from the fire and handed it to her. This one should be ready. Eat. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that was a good chapter. <laughs> okay, just let me put the book down. Mm, perfect, perfect. <laughs> I've never been particularly good at fight scenes. But I think that this one turned out well. Definitely a lot of tension, and not just during the fight, though. Uh, but that's usually the way. Battles tend to bring out two urges in people. <laughs> one is to hold all of your loved ones close and make sure that they're all still safe and that you're safe. The other is, uh, shall we say, to immediately want to get on with creating loved ones for you to hold close. <laughs> And that's going to be it for this week. Remember, I'll be on Twitch tonight playing some Genshin Impact and on Saturday night when I'll be having my productivity streams. If you haven't already, check out my video on Vroid. Um, and, of course, the contest. <laughs> if you're at all interested in VTubing and want to win the character, enter the giveaway there. <laughs> I'll see you all later!